and carrying on our theme of international presenters, I'd like to introduce to you Jose Casal. A little bit about Jose before we start. Jose is a business agility coach and trainer. He was educated at the University of Kent and he tells me he instantly knew that he wanted to do web development when he started there. On graduating in 2000, he stayed at Kent and became their one and only web support officer. Six years later, he moved on to work for p Ferries and went on further to work for or with Capita, Radtac, Credit Suisse, the Student Loans Company, the British Computer Society, McKinsey & Company, Evening Coders and Emergen. And he founded, and I didn't ask you about the pronunciation of this, Actinio, oh, good, Consulting. Now, to say that Jose is pretty passionate about modern management methodologies, such as Agile, DSDM, Lean, and Strengths-Based Leadership, might be a bit understating it. So let's, let's hear why. Over to you. Let me just set up quickly. I'm taking the opportunity to stop blushing. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, so yes, um, uh, thanks for the introduction. I, these days, I tend to work with uh, many companies in helping them, helping them improve. So we might use a different <coughs> set of <coughs> methods, different set of approaches, but the key aspect of what we're trying to achieve is not to uh, adopt a particular way of doing things, but actually just to be, make sure that we are getting better every day at what we do. Um, and over the... I don't know what I've done. I'm staying somewhere else. Um, and what we've been doing at the moment is... Is okay? Is um, we've seen the emergence of something that we call uh, business agility. Um, so uh, what business agility is, I'll talk about it later as we go along, is... The fact that what we're realizing that um, all this thing called Agile is not just really for technical teams or, um, or IT. Um, if we want to make a real difference, if we want to make a real impact, we need to get the um, agility at the business level, the whole of the business. Um, let me ask a qu quick question around you. How many of you work in what you would call um, Agile roles? Hands up, anybody? A few, very few, okay. How many of you have in your organization the word agile or agility is used? A few more. How many of you tried and it didn't work for you? Okay, all right. So, um, question that I will ask next is to say, like, um, are we, um, as a business or as an organization, as universities, are we um, as effective as we can be? And the answer usually is gonna be no. So the question would be is, the question that we ask le next is to say, what would better look like? Any suggestions? Silent crowd. <laughs> Can we give me some? We've got 45 minutes for an answer. <laughs> Unsiloed. Unsiloed, good, thank you. Fast change, Fast change. Fast change. yes. One more. Quicker decision, making. Deci quicker decision making. Okay, so those are all true. And actually, most of the time why people or senior management or leadership go for, uh, or they say, yes, we want to do Agile, um, most of the time is because they say, oh, somehow it's gonna be quicker, or cheaper, or faster, things like that. So we hear these things about like faster, cheaper, fewer defects, which is about ma ma more quality less risky, okay? So there is a real, you know, there is a, something like getting better, there is a real something that, that connects with people. Um, 
So we go and say, yeah, let's go and transform. Let's do an agile transformation. And we spend a lot of time doing it. And we put a lot of effort, a lot of money. We become impatient about it. We want to do it quickly. Um, uh, and we also like, might say, okay, let's take a little, let's do a pilot. Yeah? Um, and I've seen really, really big organizations where they do spend a lot of money, time, effort. And when you look at what they have achieved, is that it looks like that. The agile space is just one small part of the organization. Okay? Um, and we say, yeah, finally, we are agile. Um, so one, what happens with this, then, is that um, as time goes by, this agility, for whatever good reason it had to start, it's not the norm. Um, the A of agile becomes the, the A of anomaly. It doesn't work well with the organization. Um, and we lose momentum. We don't get to expand it. We don't get to make, you know, we can, you know, we just, we just doesn't work, um, and and we lose momentum. So mo many times, um, agile transformations dissolve with other tribes. You go three years, four years, five years by, uh, back, and probably people that were doing it moved on. Um, um, the company decided, or the organization decided, that this is not going to work for for us, and so on. So. Um, we can do better. Um, and I'm going to try to go over the next few minutes to some of rationale of why we struggle doing this. Um, and why I'm going to try to establish as well why agility is becoming, is not an option. It's actually something that is going to become or is a matter of business survival as we go by. So first of all, when we look at an organization, Organization has what, we, what what an organization looks like. It's a set of things that are visible, um, formal systems, and then there is things which are invisible, informal systems. The, and it looks like an iceberg. The visible formal system are things like our organizational chart, the job titles, the processes, the tools, the responsibilities. Thing that we probably have documented in, that, in some ways, yeah? Um, and these are things that are relatively, relatively easy to change. The informal system, invisible one, the one that is under the surface, it's much harder stuff to define and see and understand. Uh, the language that we use the customs, the behaviors, the fears, the aspirations, the values, beliefs, uh, stereotypes, um, the taboos that shall not be talked about, all those things. That's what we call the culture of our organization, the DNA of our organization. Yeah? These things that are under the surface form what becomes our, our culture, our, you know, our DNA, and so on. It's really, really, really difficult to change. Yet it's fundamental if we want to get better. So when we go and say, yeah, let's go and change, let's become agile, what do you think we change first? <coughs> we change the processes, like perhaps adopting an agile method. What else? We buy tools. And we probably start defining new role titles. Maybe we change the, the structure of the teams. We only change really the top most of the time. So we end up like that. We end up with what we call, you know, misaligned organizations, broken cultures, where what we practice is not what we are, or what we're trying to, the way we, we start reorganizing, moving the organization, it's moving much quicker than the things behind. And that, the bottom of side of the iceberg, it's the real difficult part. It's the thing that really persists a lot of the time. I have a bugbear, for example, with language. As human beings, our, our strength is in communication. Most of us will complain that we don't communicate well in the organizations. Who will agree with that? Yeah? Communication is at the core of everything. So you will say communicate, communicate, communicate. Okay? But then we don't pay attention to the language that we use. Yeah? I, I for example, just a small, my tiny rant. Yeah? Um, I hate, for example, the using the word resources. I am not a bloody machine. 
I'm a person. So human resources, for example, is a problem for me. Yeah? So we said, like, you know, let, let's, let's look at the language that we want to use. And we use, and all the other things in there. So that's one of the things that we have struggled, that we don't really pay enough attention to the, to the soft side, which is the difficult side, or the very hard side. And then the other one is that the way we have been managing product development, IT work in particular, things, things that we, are, we require a creative aspect, knowledge work, that way we've done it is wrong. It's wrong for knowledge work. And it's not just a little bit work, wrong. It's extraordinarily wrong. Okay? Um, why is this? Mainly is because we have been very successful elsewhere. Um, 20th century saw a huge, huge transformation in human society, the whole industrialization process, where we went from, we learned to do things at mass scale. And if you compare, for example, one of the early you know, stages of, of the Ford factory, to what a car manufacturing is today, is hugely transformative what happened over the 100 years. Um, and we're still working on resolving the main problem, which is automation. Well, well, actually, the, what we're seeing with the culmination of that process is automation and the removal of human beings from the, from the production line. Um, so I'm not saying that that's a good thing. That's why it's going on. So this was so successful that we also came up with some really, really good ideas, like the invention of management, scientific management, the invention of things like division of labor and so on. And it worked absolutely brilliantly for industrial environments. When we moved to knowledge work, things like IT, it doesn't work. It's a different, I'm gonna use the word paradigm. So, there are, there are things where we are similar, the patterns of we want to do things, we want to do things quickly, we want to do things effectively, and so on. But the context, the, con the, 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 con the con con characteristics of the domains that we work in are different. Um, so industrial spaces, manufacturing, is what we would call a complicated domain or space, where the output that we do is repetitive you get practically this, you, you have a production line, you can get practically the same thing. It's predictable. You can really estimate and calculate how long, how many cars an hour can you produce, how many cars a year you can produce. It's fixed. Or to a certain degree, it's known what you're gonna do. You've got the, the blueprint of the car. And you, can, and you can just build it. Just. <laughs> and it's visible. You can see the work happening. You can see the output being, being created. Knowledge work is different. It's what we call complex domain. It is unique. Most of the work that we do has a component which is unique. We haven't done it before. There will be something similar that we may have done it before, but it's this particular need is not the same, it's new. And that's exactly usually where the actual value of the product is. If we already had it before, we will buy off the shelf and wouldn't touch it. Yeah? Or we will download it from Google. When we do product development, usually that value add that we're trying to create is exactly where we haven't done it before. So it's unique, it's new. Because it's new and unique, it has an element of unpredictability. I don't even know whether it's buildable yet. Um, evolves. How many times you have projects where the, the requirements keep changing over time? Okay, most hands up. And it tends to be invisible. You don't see the people working. W when we are working, you don't see work. I could be walking on the street doing work. Or I could be sitting in front of a desk doing work. work. You cannot see when and where work is happening. So there are different types of work. I, I, just to give an example, complicated environment is, for example, producing these this chairs in a football stadium where you try to get every chair to be the same. And 
IT world is a much more artisanal, creative process where there are similarities. I may have chairs with armrests or with wheels, four legs, one leg, but each one of them has its own characteristics. Okay, with that? And the, the, why this is important is because we need to spot what, what are we trying to do. Um, there, is something, uh, there is something called, um, we use uh, complexity theory, something called uh, Cunevin. If someone is Welsh can correct my pronunciation. Um, something that is, is Cunevin. And it's talk about com uh, complexity, scenarios dealing with complexity. Um, so you can see the complicated and the complex things. In our organizations, we probably have an element of all these things going on. And understanding what we're trying to do on this occasion is important. Um, something that is obvious is something that all of us can do. So the key thing is that you sense the problem, someone maybe calls you in first line of support. What we try to then is to categorize it. Oh, this fits this pattern that I've already seen before. So I'm gonna give you an answer. Typical thing that you see in first line support, this is the things that we try to automate or categorize, yeah? Um, and we can establish best, best practices. If we don't know the answer, hopefully there is someone else in the organization that knows the answer. We usually go to the expert, we scale it up. That typically shows an, uh, something that will be complicated, where the sensing maybe I need to try to see if I can replicate it. If I replicate it, then I can analyze it and maybe I can come up with a new solution for it. And what you will see in complicated environments typically is that what we have is guide, good practices, guidelines, suggestions. If you happen to see this, maybe you can try to do that. So we have potential answers, but they are a little bit more, less, less categorical than best practice. Yeah? Um, these elements are, uh, are elements with areas, or these two, these two domains, um, um, if, if I say the word quadrant, Dave Snowden, who created Cunevin, will kill a, a, a little puppy, so don't say quadrants. Um, but these are more, de you can be a little bit more deterministic, there are a little bit more certain spaces. This one is very certain. As we get more uncertainty, we go into complex spaces. And in complex spaces, we, we, we need to discover what's happening. We have hypotheses, we don't have requirements. So the first thing we need to do is to create an experiment, to probe, see what happens, and then we, do, we re respond to it. What we have is that we have emerging practices. That is most of where IT work is, at least product development, project development. We need to be empirical. We need to have a discovery process. And chaotic is just that it's so urgent that I have to just up. I cannot even put an experiment. Okay? thing that matters here is that in this space in particular, what you used to have is that you have the expert piece at the, at, in a hierarchical way. The, 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 the manager or the leader will have known the answers before. So it's about command. As we go towards complexity, there is a, a curious thing which is a reversal, reversal of expertise. The expertise is not with the managers. The expertise is with the knowledge workers. So as managers, what we need to do is to create the environment for knowledge workers to, go to, get, to work together, to foster relationships, cross collaboration, cross-functional teams, multidisciplinary teams, because also it's so complex that we need to create all this discoverability. So we need to get all these people with different knowledge, different expertise coming together and in engage in a creative process. But one curious thing is that there is a reversal of expertise. As a manager, when I became a development manager, I really, really, very quickly became obsolete. If I see young developers out of university today, they are doing magic. I don't understand it. Yeah? My 15 years of development from university, they don't help. I can have a conversation, logical conversation about what development would be, but don't ask me to program anymore because that is magic, what they do. So there is an inversion of expertise. People close to the work are the experts. The further away you are from the work, the least of an expert you become. So we said that then in here, there is um, an element of interdependence. 
we need all these relationships and there is a le an element of uncertainty. So, which means that if we have uncertainty and interdependence, what we must then adopt is experimentation and discovery. We have to use the language and the practice of, uh, in, in, of interdependence. Which is a problem, because as human beings, we like certainty. We like managers to say, I know what I'm doing, follow me. Politicians, what, what do you think, do you think that a politician says, I am gonna have a guess, we'll get many votes. You want a politician to say, we're gonna do something that is very painful, trust me, I know what I'm doing. We believe in that message. We seek certainty in our life. Let's not talk about the current political, but you know you can see this. Um, so that's a problem in complex thing environments. Is they you know there is no certainty. Um, so we have to become comfortable with uncertainty. The, the seek, seeking certainty has created what we call what I call myths of product development, where we pretend that, or we actually, let's say, we believe that customers know what they want. We believe that the creatives, that would be the knowledge workers, the developers, marketing people, and so on, know how to build it. And obviously then nothing will change along the way because we know what we're doing. That has a problem. And that problem is called reality. What's the reality? Customers don't know what they want. When do customers know what, we, what they want? When you don't give it to them, definitely. <laughs> what else? Where else? That's very true. When they see what they want, or don't, when they see it or not see it, for example, when they can taste it, smell it, touch it, interact with it. We ask the customers to tell us, we do all, all these requirements, gatherings, all those, you know, many different ways of capturing customer needs. And those are okay, it's important to do that. Yeah? But even then, the customers don't really know what they want. We only, it's the three common ones that say, like, you know, I, I know I asked you for this, but now that I see it, it's just not working. Yeah? When you see something on the internet, say, oh, that T-shirt that, that will be brilliant. And then you put it on and you're like, no. Yeah? So we need that empirical interaction. The customers discover what they want as we introduce them to the product. How about the creatives, the IT developers, infrastructure, architecture? Do they know what, how to build it? Well, if it's the first time that I'm going to build this specific solution, I might have some idea of how to build it, but I have no certainty how to do, actually do it. We're going to be discovering what I need to build. I might think that I might sol solve it in this particular way, but you start going down different rabbit holes until you come up with the right solution. That's why take many times what we do is like we do the um, refactoring process. When you build it first, it's terrible, and then you refine it. You make it work, and then you make it work well. But that discovery process of saying, how do I make it work the first time? Yeah, so there's an element of discoverability. Which is interesting when, you try to, when we ask people to do estimation. Because we are asking them to estimate on things that we don't know exactly how to do it yet. Yeah? And if those two then involve discoverability, then the last one, the natural things that we have to expect changes along the way. Don't resist change. Change usually is an opportunity to learn, to create better products. You know, those difficult customers that tell us the things that don't work are just also telling us what will make the product something that we will love. Yeah? <coughs> so expect change as an opportunity to learn, to improve, and to deliver something that is absolutely brilliant to the customers. The best products are those ones that really respond to the customer needs. And then you can do all these things about data gathering, understanding BI, 
the business intelligence, all the data analytics to also see how users also use our products, which probably is in a different way than we thought it was. So the reality is all about discoverability and uncertainty and, this, you know, and, and, and responding to that, to that new thing. So if we have a very product, a difficult product environment, one thing that we tend to do then is to say, let's call in the experts. How many times you have had like, let's get our A team in for this project? Anybody seen that? Not the film, but the A teams at work. They will crash and burn as well. Many times you, you put the best people that you have in the organization together and they also, they also can, can, can fail. Why many times as well? It's because we, although we have done a lot of in space in the agile, we have, we have done the idea of how to do work in teams. The reality for most of our work is that we have really long value chains. From idea to market, from idea to a service provision, there are many, many, many steps, which you cannot do with a small team of, say, four to uh, five to eight people. There are just too many skills, too many needs there. Okay? So, what we haven't done well yet taking photo of the A-team. What we haven't done uh, well yet many times is that we say, all right, so stop doing the hierarchical organizations. Let's go flat and just start doing teams. Yeah? Where business agility is coming a lot is that when then we, we struggle is that the problems, the challenges, don't happen at the team level, although there are challenges, the real opportunity to make things better is what happens between the teams. This is where you see delays, cues, friction, infighting between teams, infighting between departments. Yeah? When we, when, it's when we have all this interdependence. Our organization should look much more like a biological self structure than a rigid structure. Yeah? Um, as a, if I give an example, if you have one single um, enterprise architect in the organization or one single UX person or something like that, and that person is there, this person is providing a service to many other departments or many other teams. Yeah? That person, single unit team, if you want to call it team, we, have, we, have, we are abusing the concept of teams sometimes. Teams are great if you have, you can create a multidisciplinary element, but if there is one person doing that role in your, in your organization, for example, that person cannot be part of many teams. That's disconcerting for human beings, yeah? So what that person is doing is a service to many of them. And these lines can become agreements, service agreements, ways of working, operational practices, whatever it is, yeah? Rather than, and ma if you leave them unmanaged or unvisualized, these are just friction lines where everybody hates each other. And this cell or this organism cannot survive on its own. None of these cells can, su can succeed on their own. We all have to work together. Okay? So we need to start thinking a lot more about how to organize for complexity. Um, I would fully recommend that you get a book. It's called Organizing for Complexity. Very simple book. I think you can even get it for free as a PDF. Why this matters is because many times when you start looking at organization and you go beyond just the one team, you realize that the real benefit is across the whole organization. So you end up trying to say, what do we need to do from the ideas to market, to having, for example, students using our systems. And there is a whole set of activities that happens when you start mapping it. Um, we have a simple, for example, in this one is a, is a, is a fintech company. And the end-to-end -end process was, they said that we have to, the first thing is about creating ideas. Then we start choosing which one of those ideas may look like potentially more interesting for us. Then we start preparing to start saying, okay, how would that idea would look like 
so maybe some prototypes, some, some preparation. Then we go into the whole empirical part of like, you know, the making side, and eventually is the marketing. And market is, was our hypothesis here, our idea, actually delivering what we thought it was going to do. Most of the times we put things out there and we never evaluate how successfully it, w it works, whether it fits the customer needs. Okay, so when we did this with a company, it was interesting because all the, all the agile work until then had been concentrated in the making, in IT. Yeah? The interesting part is that when, you measure, when we measure all these four probably big initiatives or projects, things like that, it might have taken about 90% of the time it took us to put things into, into production, 90% of that time was in deciding what to do. The doing was generally okay. Yeah? So we try to optimize, we are trying to optimize again, one part which is important as it is, it can be, op it can be improved, but the real elephant in the room many times is what happens before the decision making. The fact that it takes, you know, it takes three years to get a project started because there is this huge pipeline of projects and we don't know what to do with it. Okay? So there is opportunities to do that. Which means that most of our work, uh, uh, actually, as a, as a side note, um, I was working with a university um, some years ago, and the initial premise when they called us was to say, look, um, our development team, it just, look, we need to make them agile, our IT team, because, because it just doesn't work. They're not delivering anything. So if we cannot make them agile, um, well, it's either make them agile or else kind of situation. Um, so the first meeting that I went in, um, there was a it was a project management meeting. This happened every day, every week. It was about two, two to three hours um, meeting. Um, and they were evaluating 95 projects. From sort of like the few weeks project to the three year, let's change the academic registra registration system, yeah, the student record system. So I felt like, God, I just, I, I probably got it wrong, you know. How big is your IT department? How many people are en engaged in development, testing, design, and architecting this thing? I mean, you've got 95 projects on the go. Any guess? Fif 15 people. <laughs> I had 95 projects on the go with 15 people doing it. A ratio of five projects per person. It's like, you do realize the problem. How many project managers in that room? 12. <laughs> they were almost, mo they, were, they were hiring to coordinate the friction of this project that was started and we can never give any project. And we had the actual making not happening because we were constantly jiggling, you know, spinning plates. So it was like, look, I'm just, gonna get, I'm just gonna get myself out of a job here, but what about if you just pick three projects and see what happens? They picked five, and within three months, they delivered four of them. It was like, like magic. <laughs> Didn't have to change anything else other than that stop taking on a lot of work, okay? So what happens in most organizations, that's what I call, I call it organizational constipation. <laughs> and I left the metaphor there, okay? Um, we start lots of things and never finish. So the natural state of projects in most organizations is to be in a queue waiting for someone to give it a little bit of love. Yeah? Most of organizations have become not value generation, they have become queue management companies, which is terrible. Yeah? This is like, imagine when, you go to, when we go to the doctor. You, want to, you, you, you discover a little lump here. You have to get the GP, so you have to make an appointment. You spend five minutes, say, oh yeah, yes, I have to refer you, like, yeah, as if I didn't know that, but anyway. So then, the, okay, you, get, you have to wait for the referral letter, and then you have to wait for an appointment, and you have three, three weeks or four weeks waiting. Then you go for five minutes to get the scan, and then you have to wait a few weeks to get the biopsy or whatever it is, yeah? And it might take three months, four months, six months to get an answer, for something that effectively has only taken a few hours of work, yeah? 
we are running extremely inefficient organizations. The, the example of the doctor is probably something that we all can uh, you know, relate to. Our businesses are even worse. Most of our organizations, when we measure them, we are running at 1% efficiency, which means that 90% of the time, of the history of any project has been wasted in a queue. That's how bad it gets. And it's typically because we have too much work on the go. So this is, for example, a photo of a major uh, uh, financial insurance company um, in Europe where the first thing they did was to say, uh, some, someone came to one of my training classes, and the following day they put like what were the strategic initiatives that they had on the go. Yeah? And suddenly they had like, ooh, we have a lot of things to do. Yeah? So even just having to have a visualization about what is the macro level, the big picture, it started to allow people to say, we have to actually start focusing. We are trying to do too much and we have no focus. Um, this is in government um, where we had, this is what the about 60 people in an IT department were actually doing, but we started to visualize what we had to do afterwards. So having the door here was a great thing. Um, accidentally because the, the meaning of moving from here to there, it, means, it meant that now we're gonna do it. Until then, this is just an option. We may or may not do it. But there were, you know, easily three or four years worth of work in that wall. But putting it on this side, it said, stop asking us. We are not doing it yet. We can't. Let us finish. And we transformed our, the perception that we had as, a, as an organization that we could start delivering better by trying to do less. So, stop starting and start finishing. We are really good at getting started, we are really bad at getting finished. So let's start finishing things before we start more. Which also means we need to work smarter and not harder. Yeah? Being busy is not the ideal. That's the wrong mindset. What we need to be is working smartly. There's no need to do 16 hours a day, 16 hours a day, to achieve results. If we have that, if we have to do a lot of our work, we probably have too much work on the go. Do less, do it better. And if we don't do this, our quality goes down the pan, which then means that we are flooded with quality, fixing the quality. Defects, production issues, products that customers don't, don't, work, don't like, okay? And if we don't kill your work in progress, then you will kill your business. We go back to that university that nothing could be delivered, yeah? So kill, kill your week, not your business or your people, okay? Why this, they, they, they has, it has scientific backing for this? If we know of network theory or queuing theory, um, in, in environments with uncertainty and variability, as we get more and more utilize, utilized, the time to complete the work grows exponentially. We see this in motorways. Motorways are designed to be in optimal flow to about 60% capacity. Yeah, at 60% capacity you can still choose your speed and, more or, and maintain it. So your, time, your journey time is not affected. More than 60%, things start getting a little bit be too busy for us, too busy to be comfortable. So people become a little bit more defensive. You start getting people breaking, keeping a little bit more distance, impatient ones trying to change lanes, and so on, yeah? By the time we are at 80% utilization in a, in a motorway, we start getting cues. It slows us down. Yeah? At 100%, we have gridlock. Enough. You know, you cannot actually move. So your, t your journey times go up. What about 110%? It's a pile up. You literally have to have cars on top of each other. Yeah? So if someone ever tells you, give me 110%, you run a pileup, a personal pileup, a team pileup, an organizational pileup, yeah? 
Complex workload project management follows the same patterns that you will see in a motorway. Traffic is a complex environment with lots of uncertainty. The problem why we keep obsessed with utilization is that we uh, have glorified being busy. How many of us go and say, like, oh, I'm so busy? Yeah? As if it is a good thing. Actually, it's a bad thing. I am guilty of this, by the way. Yeah? I am so busy. Yeah? We don't build the slack in our systems. So why we do that, we value business, because in manufacturing, a resource that is not being used is wasted money or time. So we want to have our, re our resources, machinery, in work. Because we have the resource management thinking, we want our people to be fully utilized. However, in creative environments, 100% utilization kills creativity, kills thinking. We need the space to think. And also we need the slack to react to the uncertainty, to the, mm, what I was trying to do didn't work. Therefore, I have to try something else. The discoverability of like, ooh, I had a new idea. If we do this a little bit different, we could do something else. Yeah? We, are, we don't al allow ourselves the space to actually be creative, to work in complex environments. So we overpromise and we end up disappointing people, either by not doing stuff or by having to put extra hours, which makes us tired. And if we, make a, if we are tired, we make mistakes. The most dangerous time after a long night of work, if you stay at work, the most dangerous time where most of the mistakes happen is the following morning. When you're not thinking and you're not really at the top of the game. Yeah? So if someone is overworked all, all the time, if we are not resting, if we don't have real work-life balance, if we cannot have a sustainable work environment, we are in a constant death spiral of mistakes, 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 mistakes. Quality goes so build a little bit of a cushion, under promise, and then over deliver. Give yourself the space to succeed. Okay? Where that point is, is somewhere between, you know, around 80%, 60 to 80, 90, depends on your organization. Okay. Have you seen this triangle? Okay, so in manufacturing, this is an extremely powerful thing, yeah? Because um, I know the time it takes me to build any of these chairs, potentially. I can calculate it, yeah? So I will know how many of these chairs I could produce an hour, a day, a month, or whatever. I know the cost, because I know how much the raw materials have, have worked for us, how, mu how much the, cost, the raw materials have costed. And I know the scope, because I know the design. Very powerful, very powerful. Of course, there is one other element that we never talked about, which is the quality, because it's implied. Of course, we're going to build something that is with high quality. Um, but we know that when we tried to do this in, in the agile space, it, it didn't work. You cannot fix all these bits. Yeah? And usually, we started with plan-driven projects, give me all the requirements. So we went clever. And we said, let's reverse this. Um, let's go from plan-driven projects into, which usually overrun and, and they're more expensive. Reverse that, this triangle, and let's fix the time. We invented the time box, the sprints, short cycles. Good idea. And we also then fix the costs. We have a stable teams. Yeah? And what we said is, Ah, let's make the, uh, the quality explicit. Let's agree our quality criteria. So the one thing that we will compromise on is the scope. It's a great idea. Yeah? The problem might be that then you say, well, yeah, you are doing agile, but mm -hmm, every two weeks, mm -hmm, great. But by the time that we're running the project, if you haven't delivered me the scope, you keep going. So we are still doing the mindset of, you know, big projects just in small chunks. Um, in business by agility terms, this is just not good enough. And it's not good enough because we still have, we put the on time, on scope, on cost, the on in front of each one of them. So 
if being on time becomes really, really important, um, we, we will add buffers which makes us slower. If on cost becomes important, we put contingencies which makes us more expensive. And if um, we have to be on a scope, we end up doing big batches and big analysis and that makes us very wasteful. So we have to break this and replace this with creating value, creating an impact, flow about how quickly we can do things, not about meeting deadlines, and finding that fit for purpose. Fit for pur purpose includes quality, something that really fits the, the needs of the customer and the organization. These three are important, but there are two more there, which is our people, is knowledge work, and learning. It's absolutely incredible how many organizations don't have any activity related to, we talk about learning to be getting better, we do professional development, but we don't build it into the organization. Yeah, yeah, you need to improve, but you do that at home. Don't do it at work, because that's not part of your job. Well, knowledge work is all about learning as well. So we need to get, uh, we need to get in mind of all this. Um, coincidentally, this gave me an acronym, which is FLIP. And what we need to do is to flip the way we do our organizations, the way we run our organizations, the way we basically build for success. And stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs> do we have time for questions or are we yeah, all no. right? Um, <laughs> if we can eat into a little bit of the uh, refreshment time, hmm. do we have any questions from the floor? Jose is... Refreshment is refre refreshment <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say a few things. I mean, there's a lot of uh, food for thought. Hmm. In that we have a question. Yes. Hi, Jose. Uh, thank you for this presentation. Uh, I want to know what your views are. You rightly say you have to kill the pipeline to get that focus. Mm -hmm. uh, but the pipeline is often the thing that's one of the least of in your control. Mm -hmm. How do you manage it? How so do you create... So one, uh, the, one of the ways that I do I manage the pipeline is not about that we need to say no. It's that we have to say no, not yet. Yeah? yeah. So we need, we, we, it's yes, but not yet, potentially, sometimes, with the pipeline. Organizations are always going to have more ideas than we have capacity to deliver them. Yeah? So we need to strike the balance and say, okay, we need to understand how, what our capacity to deliver is, what our capabilities are, and then at the other, that's, that's what we deliver, yeah? And then we need to look at our pipeline and say, what can I do? If, um, so we use things like visualization, we use things like forecasting, uh, we, we take a lot of metrics, we have a lot of conversations with organization, yeah? I understand that you have, when I was a dev the developer at the university, I had to deliver to 35 departments it was an impossible job. So I developed what I call my common sense approach. Later, it became agile, yeah? But common sense was, I cannot deliver to all of you. I am not gonna even try to do, but I'm gonna try to work with you in short cycles where we are delivering continuously. And we might say, look, you got a month to do this. We're gonna deliver as much as we can. But because there is one month, choose the most important things that matter to you, yeah? And to a department, I might say, look, in September, you've got two weeks of my time. Choose wisely. Be ready. Yeah? Companies will always have, universities will have a lot of ideas, a lot of needs with limited, I'm going to say resource, limited people, capacity to do things. Yeah? So what, what happens many times is that we don't put them, we don't give them the need of the urgency to actually select what they really need. All of them have the, their own personal pipelines or departmental pipelines. They've got to select, and you have to establish a way of agreeing that. that otherwise, organizational constipation. You, st you try to please everybody and end up pleasing nobody. Thank you. It's, a bit of a, it's a bit of an answer, but it's that. Thank you. Any other question? Um, last year, we had a a very uh, eminent presenter called Stephen Carver, who, mm -hmm. who did, a, did a presentation, um, and 
um, one of the more amusing takeaways fr from me that he said was um, about Agile um, costing more, mm -hmm. um, uh, in the end taking longer, mm -hmm. but you get uh, stuff earlier. That you was get you get you get something earlier. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, you implicitly or explicitly in your thing suggested that to the to the to, to the contrary. Where's the empirical evidence, one way or the other, that actually that actually is is impartial and and and, and performs a true analysis yeah. of of waterfall versus agile? So, what I what I would a lot of the things that we call agile today are not really agile per se. Okay, um, agile is expensive. So if you're looking at, at at cost heads and things like that, if you're looking at traditional um, cost management, it is expensive. And it is slow. The thing that we want to do is cheaper and faster actually is not true. Where is cheaper and faster is if we achieve quality deliveries where we don't. A lot of the work that we do many times is fixing the broken quality that we delivered before. Yeah? So if we concentrate and focus on delivering some things, some things well, yeah, we don't have to go and refix it. And that's the most expensive loop that you have. We have spent all this time building something that doesn't work. Ouch. Let's build it well from the beginning. That is not cheap or fast. So I'm going to use the motorway analogy. If you are in a high traffic situation, how do you get things moving faster, the cars moving faster? Speed variable, variable speed limits. Yeah? We, we force everybody to slow down to actually move faster together. It's the same thing for us. Focus, do less things, do them really well, or do them, actually do them, do them with fit for purpose, yeah? And then you achieve more. That's the empirical evidence that we have. And that's what the companies that are really out there doing this are achieving. That's why there is a lot of like incumbent players. For example, I did this presentation on the bank, and when I said like, you know, it's not an option. There is all these companies like TransferWise, have you used them? Destroying the Forex market, yeah? There are the new banks like Monzo, N26, and so on, that are giving a real scale to the banks, traditional banks. You have banks with 200 people competing with banks with 20,000 people. Who is winning? The one that is nimble, fast, and really high quality and doing things that I love, yeah? So there is all these things happening there which, which you know, we need to really deliver to the customer needs and we do that with, with small, quick, iterative processes and, and products that fit the customer needs, that make products that people really love, that it works, yeah? Hmm. Are you going to be around? Yes. For the rest of the morning? Yes, um, until Lovely. the end so of the day. Please <laughs> do come and talk to Jose. Um, we'll break now for refreshments. As I said before...